done so convincingly. So, uh, of course, the shadow of that game, I think, has haunted uh, the rivalry between these two players ever since. We've had uh, a lot of interpersonal rivalry, a, a lot of score settling uh, on the board, strictly on the board. And guess what? We do have a London system by Ferruja, a clear indication that he wants to start from scratch. He wants a completely different tenor of the match compared to yesterday's match against MBL. Yeah, Daniel the Prophet, you're back. A London system, as you predicted. And it looks like Yanda Pomlishi predicted this as well. Um, he's played into a very direct variation where Black actually grabs and trades off that uh, key London bishop. The dark square bishop for white is gone. Whoa, uh, whoa, now. whoa. Could you please <laughs> relax? The happy. bullet championship is over, Ali Reza. You've already won it. <laughs> You've so already fast, won it. these players, Daniel. <laughs> and wow, what's this last move? Black doesn't even take back the pawn he sacrificed five moves ago. <laughs> this is weird stuff. What? Calm down, please. I can't. Not at my advanced age. I don't even understand what's <laughs> happening here. Long castles, then a4, establishing the bishop on b5 makes sense on the surface. Are you telling me that this position is still in some chess base file that they had to dust off and dig up from 2013? I mean, it's not just in one of their chess base files. Clearly, it's in both of them, uh, both of their <laughs> opening repertoires. They've clearly both done their homework here. Yan is the first one to pause. Ferruja. What move are we on now? Like uh, move 20 pretty much almost. And uh, he's barely spent any time. He's game time almost. He's and game time. Daniel, yeah, this is crazy. You talk about your advanced age. I mean, Jan Nepo, he's even older than you. How can his heart take it playing such crazy chess? Well, he finally slows down. He is the first to settle down and assess the situation. And he is down a pawn. But Ali Reza taking the advice, um, the gratuitous advice shared by the commentators to heart. He says, you want me to play faster? Hey, how about I'll play so fast I'll have 13 minutes at the end of the game. How do you like that, huh? And uh, so far, it seems to be working out pretty well. Now, I think the big question here for Black, where do you put this knight on c6? Because my instinct, David, is to move this knight uh, so that you mm -hmm. open up the attack on the c-file and so that eventually you try to round up this pawn on c5. But there are quite a few tempting squares. I mean, knight b4 is the obvious move. Maybe a move like knight a7, because knights on the rim are the best, uh, as the advice goes. What would you do? in this position Oof. like you said my eyes were instantly drawn to knight b4 um again i'm not sure why i guess it's a forward jumping move and you threaten kind of to win your pawn back uh, restore the material mm -hmm. balance um just looks like the most active choice knight a7 is also tempting uh, because you do create that concrete threat of trading off white's bishop the black a pawn would then be free and um, you kind of gain a tempo i'm assuming white would have to drop back with that bishop um, to d3 in the near future but no he does play the more human approach and the eval bar immediately rises the question mark appears why could that be man i don't understand anything anymore and m maybe the reason is positional right often when you see the eval bar move up you just kind of assume that the reason is tactical something was missed you know a pawn was blundered somewhere but maybe what the engine is saying is that even if black were to capture uh to recapture on c5 White has this nasty little move, c3, and the problem is that the knight cannot return back to its uh, home square on c6. It'll, it, it'll have to drop back to a6, and I would take a knight on a7 over a knight on a6 any day of the week, particularly on Monday. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it's uh, just Monday. Um, the tournament's been going on for a long, long time, it feels like, but uh, we're at the start of this week and at the start of this uh, loser's final and knight b4 i wonder whether it's just f5 whether you just continue pushing forward maybe including c3 or not first of all um uh, maybe in something in conjunction with that just to try and break the black pawn chain um yeah i don't know whether you start with rook uh, to e1 just to uh, get ready for that advance but uh, either way a very natural move and um okay Ferruja is the f kind of taking his first big thing i remember that was the advice of one of my first coaches dania I'm a time travel addict, I always have been, and my coach was like, okay, just start learning some openings that get you to move 20 where you don't need to think. You kind of blitz out half the game, you save the remainder of your time for the critical moments. And I was like, wait, that actually makes sense. Um, right. So that's when I kind of first started studying openings and it seems to be working for Ferruja here. He's got a great position and loads of time on the clock as he does go F for forward, F5. Great call, uh, David. And I think that there's kind of a funny subtlety uh, in the sense that he is sort of delaying the move c3 and saving it for the right moment. Um, just really quickly to rewind, if I understand this correctly, the reason that c3 uh, was not as effective is because here the knight drops back to a6 and it essentially has an exit ramp, right? So this is the subtlety that always hides behind the scenes of these games. Now, if you play f5, black kind of solves all of his problems 
uh, particularly the problems with uh, the knight by recapturing on c5. So Ferruja waits for the black bishop to capture on c5. Now he plays c3, and now the knight is once again, well, now the knight finds its way back to c6 somehow, and now the players continue blitzing out their moves. Yeah, I'm really surprised, actually, that Ferruja rushed to take on e6. It didn't feel like that was yeah. immediately necessary. He could have brought his rook to e1 first. He could have played queen h3 first, keeping the idea of f6 open for later. And now, as the blue arrow points out, black actually has a nice post for his rook on f6, defending, controlling. That wasn't available. So talking of these subtleties you mentioned on the last move, uh, Dania, this subtlety seems to favor black. And this is a pretty important moment because uh, the move that you would play in a bullet game, sort of the instinct move, uh, is rook a to e8, and it can be, uh, it can look nice to position your rooks next to each other, but that's not an economical use of resources. Also, that move would pin the knight on c6. Rook f6 is not a move that Jan is going to miss, and dare I say he's close to solving his opening problems, but David, I still think his position is a little bit uncomfortable, and maybe a couple of accurate moves separate him from full equality. This central construction is anything but stable, Rook e8, rook takes d5 is just one of many examples that highlight it. Yeah, and he does stabilize with uh, swinging his queen over, uh, missing the blue arrow move rook h6, but I think that's uh, another one he wants to save up his sleeve for later. And now f4 recommended by the computer. I'm assuming that's the computer's arrow, not yours, but um, that's a cool move, just locking down uh, Black's pawn chain there in the center just while Black is unable to capture on f4. It's a logical move when it's played on the board, and yet I'm far from convinced that uh, I would have mustered up the courage to play it, even in a classical game. Yes, the F2 pawn is technically hanging, uh, but I don't think that's White's biggest concern. I think the big concern uh, is that Jan's uh, central pawns are set in motion, and this is why Mr. Ferruja, um is sitting in that chair and playing this move. F4 is found, and out of the sleeve of Jan Nepomnishi comes Rook H6. But has this move lost a little bit of its effectiveness compared to the previous move? The queen can zigzag out of uh, the side attacks by the rook and park itself on f3. Yeah, again, it's all these subtleties. It's all these move orders, uh, Daniel. Mm -hmm. like, we talk about move orders so much. I didn't really understand the concept of move order until I was in my teens. And um, yeah, if black had hit the white queen previously uh, on the last turn, while the white pawn were back on f2, then there's no hiding space behind any pawns for the white queen. Suddenly, like you say, um, yeah, rook h6 here, for example, if queen g4, rook g6. If queen f3, rook f6. You just perpetually hit this white queen, harass, uh, <laughs> harass her until she drops back to a bad square, like e2, for example. But now she has a beautiful square on f3. And um, yeah, it's these Difference. small little details. And so he goes a completely different direction. He takes on h2, but that is not a move you play because you're so happy to be capturing white's pawns. This already kind of reeks of desperation. I think Nepo is trying to complicate the game to make it tactical. Now, wait a second. Rook takes e6. Is he relying on rook takes g2? And just looking at the eva bar, does that succumb to a tactic? Or does white just recapture on g2 and then take on d5 and claim that the light square control is going to make black's position untenable? Yeah, even me, who's reluctant to calculate, would uh, be looking at that variation, <laughs> Dania. And uh, even just the simple recaptures, taking on g2, take on d5, the black king looks so much more vulnerable than its counterpart. The white king is going to hide out super safe forever on the a2 square. The black king is going to come under some heavy, heavy pressure. Um, so at the very minimum, I would say um, that would be a tempting option for Ferruja. This might be where he starts burning a lot of time, though, because suddenly options are opening up. Um, it looks tempting to just kind of sit on the position. Oh, queen takes even you're highlighting. Well, that's one of the annoying things, right? You see an obvious move like rook takes e6. You're about to play it, and then and then you stop yourself. And you say, well, wait a second. Queen takes e6 gets the queens off the board. And I actually like this option. The Soviet schoolboy inside of me says that all of white's advantages uh, are maintained even with the queens off the board. And yes, including the chances for a lightning attack against black's king. And I'm seeing tons of variations to confirm that point if this bishop on b5 david drops back to c4 and obviously i'm talking after the queens are traded and white takes this hapless pawn on d5 there's going to be mate threats coming from everywhere against black's king i think black is just borderline losing here bishop takes c6 is also a threat what a nasty yeah. nasty end game yeah even now <laughs> bishop takes c6 if you want to be wait rook 
Ooh, Rook takes C6 for a second. I was very tempted by oh, if you want to force some trades uh, in the position right now. But either way, White's going a pawn up at the very minimum, right? Yes, and you have to be very careful if you're Ali Reza. I don't think that he should reinvent the wheel here. Looks like Rook takes D5 is by far uh, the move with the most meat on the bone. The problem if you play a move like Rook takes C6 is that, yes, you might win. You might emerge a pawn up, but Black has this little pawn on H7. Doesn't look like it will amount to anything now. But when that pawn lands on H3, you might start changing your mind. I think Ali Reza needs to be efficient here. He needs to trust his instincts and just take that pawn on D5. Yeah, keep all of the threats up your sleeve for later. There's a bunch of chess cliches about the threats being stronger than the execution, and this might be uh, kind of uh, showing that that is true. And oh, you spotted more tactics. Can I show a, a cute but irrelevant but still very cute mating pattern? Let me just very very quickly yeah. make a couple random moves for Black. The point of Bishop C4. What threat does this actually create? Well, among the many threats, there's a beautiful mate with Rook to D8. One Rook selflessly gives itself up, and so does the other Rook. Except you can't capture it because this is a double check and a mate. A double discovered mate. Not something that you say every day. Obviously, this will not happen. But, David, let me tell you, bishop c4 is just as serious, if not more serious, of a threat than bishop takes c6. Just to make matters even worse for Nepo. Exactly. Bishop c4, even if the black king sidestepped, you've cleared, you've uh, kind of created this launch pad for the white rook on b5. Rook oh. b5 will come and wait. Bishop Let's C4 see wins. It. Wait, he's played rook B8, the random move that I played just to just to pass the turn to show the mating pattern. He's actually made that move. And the reason he's made that move is to deter the move bishop takes C6. I think Jan has completely neglected the other side of the coin here. Wow. And let's maybe talk about that variation. Let's follow it through. Why is white winning there, bishop C4? If the black king sidesteps um, from those beautiful checkmating patterns. What? Well, now there's another problem, and it's rook b5, yeah. David. And guess what? I'll let you do the honors in this position. Uh, rook takes b7. <laughs> I think the back rank checkmate still persists. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm missing anything here. Rook to e8 is a checkmate. The black king trapped, and black's pieces are all falling. They're like dominoes, and bishop c4 on the board. This oh. could be lights out for Jan Nepomnishi in this first game. Such a perfect illustration of the fact that opposite colored bishops have this tactical edge to them. And, you know, we keep saying this because it's a really important concept. The fact that, yes, if you eliminate all of the other pieces, uh, it gives the defending side great drawing chances. But white's monopoly over the light squares shines through in every single move of this line. Bishop c4 ends the game. There is nothing to say here. It's over. He's got the threat of rook d8. He's got the threat of rook b5. There's nothing that Jan can do here. He is totally helpless. What a what a display by Ferruja. So yeah, smooth. This is Ferruja in top form. Like when he gets his opening preparation in, when he's still got time on the clock, um, he's just phenomenal. And um, there was a sneaky look at the camera. Ferruja has been glancing over at Jan Nepomnishi on the camera to check out his expressions. He knows he's winning. He does the power, kind of lean back, the uh, sip of water. And oh, yeah. I just want to highlight, Danya. That connect four is my favorite pawn structure, but this is connect four of pieces on that diagonal. And uh, just look at the light square domination. It's beautiful, aesthetically, just so, so pleasing. Uh, White's position right now. Man, that was a huge water bottle. Good to know that Ali Reza is staying hydrated. Somehow it only came out when he was winning. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if Jan resigns here. And you know, there were a lot of components to this game, but I think Ferruja's opening choice really displays uh, the kind of maturity and, and professionalism that uh, that we're used to, right? He played e4, didn't work out, so he kind of sat down and he really evaluated what kind of position he wants to go for. Uh, he did his homework, and it shines through with every move in this game. Rook b5 is on the board. It's automatic. Um, they'll see ideas like this in their sleep. Yeah, and Jan Nepomnishi shaking his head down the camera. It, we're moments away from a resignation for, uh, from him. I mean, simply nothing to do. Black's losing a piece here. I don't think you can uh, avoid losing a piece just to prevent uh, the checkmate from incoming. Bishop to a7. Will he take this pawn on b7? Is there anything even better here? I think you just take the pawn and uh, probably move on to the next game. I don't see any defense here for Black. Honestly, even if there was a queen somewhere that was hanging, I might still take the pawn on b7. Such is the <laughs> temptation, such is the power uh, and aesthetic effect a move like this creates leaving the knight entirely exposed, therefore leaving the bishop exposed. I think Jan's only try is maybe to play h5 and create a Luft square for the king. But 
I assume there must be many ways of uh, finishing this one off. Yeah, he's at least asking a question, Jan Nepomnishi. So a good tip uh, for everyone at home. Do not resign too early, even if you think you're totally lost, which Jan is here. And just in case you get one or two more moves, just in case the opponent isn't accurate and the black pawn suddenly runs down the board. But uh, yeah, I can see various ways to win a piece for white. I just would have to do some counting here if I were Alireza Fruja to ensure that the black pawn isn't running too fast. There we go, rook to e7. The black bishop, if it moves, uh, will allow a check on e8 and the black knight would be undefended. If the black knight tries to defend its bishop, knight c6, rook c7 would win the piece. Oh. And uh. yeah, this is this is over. You say dominoes, I say Pac-Man. Uh, whatever you compare this to, Jan is not going to be left with a lot of pieces. Uh, a couple of moves down the line. It's funny that Ali Reza could have also played Rookie 5, and there was another mating pattern with a uh, sort of semi-Anastasia's mate instead of a knight on e7. Hopefully there won't be a knight on e7, because that would mean uh, Ali Reza blundered his rook. But instead, the bishop on c4 cutting off the king's escape. Easy clap, Rook c7 on the board. Jan might as well try h4. But, I mean, choose your pick there. There's so many winning options. Even a check on C8 followed by a check on G8 might be an Ali Reza-style way to seal the deal. That is really clever tempo play there, Daniel. And, uh, yeah, the white bishop will always, if need be, um, kind of sit on the D5 square and cover the diagonal, the promotion square of the black pawn. So the pawn does run um, as the pieces fall, as the house burns on the other side of the board. Yeah, but I don't care. It's, uh, That's, all I, hope. That's all I need. I <laughs> Minimalism, hashtag minimalism, hashtag it's Marie Kondo, these minor pieces, who needs them anyway? I've played Ali Reza enough times to know that he is, he doesn't want to just take the knight. He wants to do this with a flourish. Uh, he wants to put the ribbon on top of the uh, gift wrapping. My vote is rook c8 and bishop g8. Yeah, I think he's going to find that. He's going to go for it. That would save white a tempo because you end up taking that black knight with a check. Once the black king is forced to the sixth rank, uh, it drops with a check and you... Aww. Oh, boo. He takes uh, the knight first, but no harm done. Still totally winning at the very minimum. Uh, bishop to d5 will come. Um, what do you uh, think the cleanest sad. is here? There we go. But you know what the sad thing is, David? The sad thing is that even in the best, absolute best case scenario for black, God forbid you play rook g1, h2, and h1, white is three pawns to the good on the queen side. And I think this might even be what Ali Res is going for just to demonstrate how hopeless black's position is when... Your best case scenario is three pawns down for no compensation. It's time to resign. Yeah, there's even threats of rook c8 and bishop e4 check in this position. And uh, black would either allow the white rook behind the h file or the black bishop would drop. So I think we'll see that uh, end oh, the no, game. No, A check no. Now. He's going to win another piece, isn't he? It's greedy. Greedy for Ruzha, but uh, just power play from him. So impressive, Dania. Um, we were talking about whether being fresh would be a benefit here, and the opening prep combined with his tactical sharpness. He's going to yeah. take the lead. This was a commanding game. Um, it's hard to say where the decisive mistake was. I think that there were a couple of sloppy moves, and it felt like it all started with night before. Impressive opening prep, assuming that it was opening prep by both sides, David. And that night leap to b4, as natural as it was to establish the night on a nice protected square, that knight ended up being the bane of Black's existence. Now he's missing the knight, and he's also going to be missing the bishop, and he's going to be missing a point, which he needs to make up in the very next game. This is going to be a very tall order uh, for Yana Pomnishi because Ali Reza's form today is clearly much improved. That's right. Ferruja on fire, and the white bishop cannot be chased forever. Um, even bishop to g8 is a threat, and uh, Ferruja takes the win. The Pomnishi resigns and will have to come back in this loser's final. What a game, Dania. Uh, just, I mean, I think it's one of the most flawless games, one of the most smooth victories throughout the whole Crunch Labs Masters so far. Yeah, this was very impressive opening preparation. Ali Raza